like I have the ultimate cocktail party job. Mm-hmm. Like it, she comes in and she's an environmental lawyer and people are like, yawn. And then they're like, what do you do? And I tell them and they're all like, wow, that's really cool. <laughs> so I get the cool cocktail party job and I like to build, I like to build stuff. Um, and so I get to go back today and you know, all the headache of HR and fundraising and trying to come up with money to b- build the building. I get to spend three hours in the shop, you know, building a custom door mm. and that makes me happy. And so, um, you know, I could put my headphones on and listen to music and build stuff and, you know, and nobody can tell me that's not what I should be doing. Yeah. Even though it's probably not what I should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. Cause that's, that's what keeps me happy and that's what keeps me going. And so I'm going to spend three hours every day working in the shop. Um, and I probably shouldn't, you know, <laughs> and the person who follows me probably won't, but Hey, you know, it's what I like. Yeah. So. Um, and that, and really that's what's kept me going for 30 years is cause I like it. It's like, it, you, you know, it's that the whole trope where you, if you like what you do, if you do, your hobby is your job, you never go to work or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And so I've kind of had that, yeah, the, the yeah. fortune, good fortune of having that. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to the Not Genius Podcast. I hope you guys had a really great weekend. We got for you guys, Andrew McKnight from the Challenge Program. Thank you so much for being on our show, Andrew. How are you doing, man? Great. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Have you ever been on a podcast like this? Not like this. No, <laughs> this is completely new. I'm, I'm impressed with the production. Oh, thank you so much for your patience this morning. I know it took maybe a little bit longer than we expected to get on, but we really appreciate you know your time and giving it to us. Sure. We were planning on just probably setting up in the other room and not kind of being around the different furniture pieces that you created. And it was kind of uncanny that we ended up in this room and... This is one of the things from the challenge program, right? This is, uh, uh, yeah, we did a lot of all, all the conference room tables in here. Mm-hmm. CSC has been a really good client. Um, we started out doing their, uh, their place out on, uh, 42. The, mm-hmm. we did a big conference table for their headquarters. And then when they moved into the city, uh, Scott used us to do a lot of desks, a lot of conference tables and make it made a good story. Yeah. yeah. This is insane how much work they, you guys have done and made an impact across the city of Wilmington. But before all that, before you were Andrew from the challenge program, <laughs> like what did you do? Who are you? What were your passions and what was your upbringing like? Um, I grew up in North Carolina. I uh, went to college. I was into marine biology, actually. I was, uh, I wanted to be a marine biologist, um, but I did a lot of outdoor education. So I did outward bound, um, did a lot of kind of, you know, adventure stuff. Um, and one of the summers when I was working for Outward Bound, I did a program, uh, with summer scholarship kids and they're kids from the Bronx and I really enjoyed it. It was, uh, something I, uh, <clears throat> kind of, uh, fell into and, and, and quite liked. So when I moved to Philadelphia for, to work at Penn, which we talked about, um, I was working at this wooden boat place. There's. Uh, outward bound world and the wooden boat world are interconnected in a weird way. Um, and I was building wooden boats at the Seaport Museum. I quit grad school and got took a job. And they asked me to start a program for uh, at-risk youth building boats. Um, I did. Uh, and I did that for about two years in Philly. And they, Calmore Nickel heard about it. And they wanted me to start a program in Delaware. Um, and so that's what brought me here. So I started the challenge program. Well, I was affiliated with Cal Marnickel for about a year and a half, and then we split out and it's been a, a separate entity ever since. So, but that's where, that's how I got into, you know, the, the, it was through kind of the outward bound world that I got into the workforce development world. Hmm. So why build wooden boats? Like, was it uh, so the, the wooden, <laughs> uh, people get into wooden boats just cause of wood and you know, like the kind of the, uh, the history of it, the beauty, you mm-hmm. know, those, there, there can be very beautiful. And then the, uh, connection to the outward bound world is that people like to get into these old boats and do kind of sail training okay. so that you can do these, uh, like hurricane Island outward bound school, you get in these pulling boats, which are these big rowing sailing boats mm-hmm. and you'll spend like a month on the water, oh, wow. uh, you know, rowing and sailing okay. and do it kind of camping. Um, and that, you know, it's kind of adventure training sort of, and that was the, you know, I was doing that and teaching that as part of outward bound 
and got into the wooden boat and that's what got into the wooden boat building. Mm. Um, and then there's this whole, uh, building wooden boats as a, as a means to teach, uh, build, uh, to teach construction math. Um, okay. and so there's a whole building to teach. It's a, it's a, it, it's interesting. <laughs> and we come full circle because, uh, we just got a pre-apprentice, uh, with, with help from CSC and, uh, and the workforce development board, we got pre-apprentice money. And so we're, uh, hooking up with the apprentice world, which is tied to the union world. And it turns out the mid Atlantic unions use wooden boats to teach their construction math. Wow. So they use a wooden boat curriculum <laughs> to teach construction math. And the guy who set up their, uh, curriculum is a guy who started a wooden boat building program same time I did in in Alexandria, okay. and so he and I just had lunch last week with the uh, the Mid Atlantic Union, and I you know we were laughing that thirty years ago we were like wooden boat builders, <laughs> and now we're both doing pre apprentice you know union carpentry stuff. So yeah. yeah, it's kind of funny. So what does your background look like, or where were your origins when it came to construction? And they, I, they weren't. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I totally started uh, as in that boat shop and approached construction through wooden boat building. Um, I, you know, we did wooden boats first, and then we did timber frames, which are post and beam, like traditional mortise and tenon uh, timber frames. There's a timber framer in in Kennet named Hugh Lofting, who I just you know, happened to call up and he got all excited and he and I started teaching classes together mm -hmm. and building timber frames. Um, and that worked out for us, uh, that the, we built a couple of small timber frames, just sheds in a barn for, for our shop. And one of the guys who took the classes, uh, ran the, um, construction for the Delaware parks and rec. Mm -hmm. And he got us to build a timber frame at, on Fort Delaware. Um, the prisoner barracks at Fort Delaware state park, mm -hmm. um, which was our first big contract. And I was, that was when kind of got us out of the wooden boats. Cause I was like, wow, I can make money mm. doing this. And so we built this crazy prisoner barracks out on uh, pea patch Island. And, um, and that, then we started doing timber frames and somebody, you know, my, on my board was like, you should do housing. So we did partnered with some of the, community development corporations to do, uh, some low income housing. Um, and it was a learning process for me. I didn't really know what I was doing, but you know, at that point I had guys working for me that did. Okay. And so kind of figured it out as we went. Um, eventually I, I bought a house, uh, in Philly that was a shell and re rebuilt it. And that's kind of where I learned to do house carpentry. So, um, but it's, it's been a process. I mean, it's been a learning process all along. I mean, the good thing about having a, you know, running your own nonprofit and working with these kids is that it, it's not as what we are building is not as important as the kind of case management part. And so you can kind of do whatever you want. And so mm -hmm. we're always, I always kind of build what I'm interested in. Mm. Um, as long as it's a good teaching thing for the, for the kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what, you know, what we're doing is not teaching kids hard skills. Mm -hmm. It's getting them prepared to be in the workforce. Yeah. And so as you know, as long as you can keep them active and keep them, pay them, mm -hmm. um, which we can, thanks to our contracts, we can do whatever we want. Um, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, that's the, the little uh, dirty secret of workforce development is it's not the hard skills, uh, for the population that we serve. It's the soft skills. So. Mm -hmm. Programs can be culinary, they can be landscaping, they could be, you know, uh, a coffee shop, they could be, oh, there's all kinds of things you could do. It's, but what you're doing is preparing people for the workforce, show up on time, you know, put your cell phone away, mm -hmm. you know, be on point. That's what you're looking for in an employee. You can, for most, in the, uh, many uh, occupations, you can teach a kid what you need to, to, for them to know, mm -hmm. as long as they're eager and they show up to work and they're, you know, and that's that's the skill they need yeah yeah so how do you teach someone those or especially the one with showing up and being excited to work if they don't already have it well you know you'd be surprised it's uh for most people it's um they they want to do well it's like you, they say people want to be coached it's like they 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 want the, that positive reinforcement hmm. and so 
what you're showing people is that, you know, showing up to work every day and, and having that kind of satisfaction of a job well done mm -hmm. is, is actually a good thing. Yeah. Like it's, it's, you're much better off than if you don't have a job and you, you don't have a purpose, <laughs> it can be, dep it's depressing. You know, it's like that, that's not ideal. Like it, it's good not to have stress, but you also want, you want to put yourself out there and have a job well done. And I think a lot of the, the trainees, uh, come back cause we, we've been doing it so long. People come back and they, they tell us that one of the biggest things they learned is that just like just the investment we put into them and that, and by seeing us, people like me and my, my team who want to be there and want to work hard and want to be successful. And they're like, wow, this is, this is great. Like, this is something I want to be a part of. This is something I want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, uh, that's a, a, as big an influence as anything else that we do. Yeah. So it's just, it's just to, to have that example. Mm -hmm. So do you guys have a structured way of leading your people or is it more so they learn by your example? How, how do, how do you go about instilling these values? Um, it's, well, there's a structure in that we're doing jobs, mm -hmm. you know, that, uh, it's a, you know, we are a contractor and so we have jobs, um, that we're responsible for, mm -hmm. um, which is key actually. That's the, like the kids are, uh, the kids, the, the youth, the young people that are, uh, that are enrolled in the program are very much tied into, we want to get these jobs done. Mm -hmm. Um, and and so working for a client is important. Um, we have to pick and choose our clients, especially in the training program, because we're slow. We're very slow. <laughs> it takes us a long time to complete projects. So, you know, we just did a house uh, at 7th and Washington, and it took us two years. Um, we're, we're to take on a contractor six months, eight months. Um, it took us two years to complete it. Uh, we overproduce. We did a really, it's a really nice uh, project, but it just takes us a long time. Um, and because our most important product is successful graduates, it's not the houses, mm -hmm. but it, it's having both and, and, you know, the kids wanting to take pride in a job well done that that's important. So keeping those clients is, is an important part of the, of the program. Mm -hmm. So what were some big challenges you faced starting and getting contracts and Oh, I mean, the biggest challenge is always pay, is, is always, uh, is payroll is, uh, cash flow. Um, and so it's just, you know, keeping up with, uh, cash flow and keeping or like whether it's raising money or earning money, um, you know, you've, it's hard when you don't have a fallback. And, and so that's always the, the biggest challenge. Um, you know, fortunately, we, we were talking earlier about being in Delaware. It's, uh, I think it's easier to fundraise in a place like Delaware that's small where you can, you know, kind of make yourself presence and make yourself known. Um, and you can get to the foundations and the, the corporate funding and to the uh, government funders without as much, you know, there's not as many fish in the pond. So that has been helpful. Um yeah, but that that's the biggest thing is, is just trying to to manage that as a business and keep the cash flow coming. Um, you know, and other than that, the it, you know working with these the the that population is is tricky, and and they, the the challenges they face are so uh, immense hmm. that uh, it's hard to believe. <laughs> you know, it's hard to believe where they come from and what they have to deal with every day, and so you've got to kind of compartmentalize. Um, yeah. so like I, I, my wife tends to think that I've become quite hardened <laughs> to, you know, and I, where I don't, uh, get as, uh, emotionally involved in, in these, uh, the, the issues that the, the trainees face. Mm -hmm. Um, I do have people that work for me who do get emotionally involved and I don't know how they do it. Um, mm -hmm. but I have, I have definitely distanced myself from that. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of tricky. Yeah. Yeah. So try, I try not to, to live and die with every success and, you know, failure that we have. I just I kind of let it roll off me, but, um, yeah, that can be kind of callous, I guess. Yeah. Wow. 
That's 30 years of being in the industry. That's it, 30 years of being in the industry. I'm <laughs> telling you, 30 years. He's jaded. <laughs> yeah, you can't do it. You can't. Yeah, you got to roll with the punches uh, over 30 years. Definitely. But, I mean, the, 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 also you have some great successes. I, had, I definitely get the the treat of having some of my successful graduates come back and, and they're certainly grateful and that, that kind of lifts your spirits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So when you started this thing like 30 years ago, you were sharing a little bit earlier about how you used to work in a medical lab. You hated it and it was not really the job for you. And then you got into this boat building thing. Like how are you supporting yourself financially and did you see this going on to be an indefinite thing or was this just a stint? Uh, it was definitely just a stint. Um, I, the, there was a grant that paid me to when I came down um, so that they had, the Calmar Nickel had gotten a $35,000 grant from FCC National Bank to start the challenge mm -hmm. program. And that was my salary um, when I first started. So I was being paid um, by that. And then I had to raise the money and I had no idea how to raise money. Um, I had no idea what I was doing, uh, but I had the, fortunately the woman, the woman who ran Calmar Nickel at the time, uh, was super supportive and basically taught me how to raise money, introduced me to everybody I needed to be introduced to. Um, and back in the day there were CRA, all the banks had CRA officers mm -hmm. or community reinvestment act officers. And mm -hmm. so, uh, the, you could use CRA money to do workforce development. Um, and, so I went to all the CRA officers and all the banks and was like, we're going to do a workforce development program. And so I was able to raise like a hundred thousand dollars in the first year, um, as a, you know, as a nonprofit and that kind of, I was, I was able to do that for two or three years, um, until we, it, you know, and it never would have hit until we figured out about the workforce, uh, investment board money, which was our first contract. So it was like by the, you know, skin of my teeth for the, like three or four years, but I was really just paying myself and one other person, uh, maybe two other people. So payroll wasn't that much. Um, I didn't have rent cause I was in the Calmar shipyard. Um, and you know, it's just trying to keep payroll going. Uh, and then, you know, the, <laughs> the other trick is that like, there's a joke, we joke at the shop that behind every good woodworker every, behind every successful woodworker is a wife with a good job and i, <laughs> and I, I had a wife with a good job so I, she was making the money and i was just trying to you know just make payroll and so <laughs> she was a lawyer and i was a nonprofit exec yeah so i had a wife with a good job <laughs> it's like a, a a man who wants to be a boy forever <laughs> well it just you know i it was a I got to be my own boss starting at 25 yeah. and, um, there was a need. So yeah. the program has kept growing because there's a need for it. And so it's, you know, it's, I, I think my parents were like, I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> and then, you know, 10, you know, five years in, they were like, Oh, we, we can't believe how great it is what, <laughs> what he's doing. So yeah, the, uh, it, and, you know, it's like, uh, it was, it was not even, I, I mean, like you said, it was a stint. It was like, I, what, I'm going to do this until I figure out what I'm really going to do. Yeah. And then it became kind of a thing. Yeah. <laughs> and here I am. Yeah. That's so. awesome. So did they just like give you the money and were like make stuff happen? Or was there like kind of a roadmap that you had to follow? It's definitely a roadmap. Um, I mean, what I learned early on, uh, is it's an investment like people are making an investment and they want return on investment um and uh you need to show uh outcomes and mm -hmm. um i mean that's key and a, a lot of people get into nonprofits and they just want to do good mm -hmm. and they um and that it's, <laughs> it's great but if you're not outcome oriented and driven to produce outcomes and be mm -hmm. successful um, it's not going to work uh, or it sets us apart. Um, so yeah. the, I think that the, unfortunately in, in the nonprofit world, there's a lot of sort of good intentions and not very good programming. Um, and you know, the, we're outcome oriented. We are driven to get successful outcomes and prove that, that what we're doing works. Mm -hmm. Um, it's part of why, 
the challenge programs remain the size it has is because if you but if you start to get too big you aren't you can't become own your outcomes you know you're you're just you're kind of trying to churn through it and it's very much on an individual basis and so you have to have that kind of individual attention to have successful outcomes mm-hmm. um so we you know state of a certain size because i know everybody who's going through the program and i know when mm-hmm. we're having successful outcomes um and we I, we know how to prove that that's being successful we know track their hours we track our, our uh, placements we track whether they're still working six months after they leave, whether they're still okay. working a year after they leave. Um, and that's, that's kind of the key to what, to what we're doing. And, um, you know, it's, we're competitive. We want to be the best. Yeah. Um, and, and I tell my, you know, if you don't want to be here, uh, if you don't want, if you don't want to be the best, I don't want you working in the program. I want to be the best workforce development program in mm-hmm. Delaware. And I want better outcomes than everybody else. And that doesn't mean I don't, you know, I don't want to support all the other workforce development programs, but that's the attitude I bring to, you know, it's, it's akin to what you would do if you're a competitive entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so that, that's an important part of the culture that we have at the challenge program. So when you say uh, outcomes, you mean like people? People, yeah, successful uh, placements, okay. meaning... Uh, you're out of the system so that, you know, the kids come to us and they've got all these barriers to employment uh, where they're in the judicial system with poverty, homelessness. Um, and then we track them. And I think long term, our success rates a little over 60, 65 percent of completely out of the system, meaning they're working, they're, uh, you know, housed, they're living a normal tax paying life. Yeah. And that's our goal. Where it's, does the average student come from necessarily in terms of like socioeconomic backgrounds or families or like uh, where geogra- geography uh they're newcastle county we get them f- there you know d- w- we get from all over newcastle county um a lot wilmington city of wilmington um they're mostly you know have a, a kind of a history of incarceration um you know they definitely all come from low income background uh and they we probably have issues with homelessness, you know, uh, lots of barriers. Um, and so we, as part of our contracts, we identify the barriers. Um, so we're, you know, we are responsible for making sure that we're serving people who need this, the, 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 the help. Um, and then we work on overcoming those barriers. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're, kids that come from the the streets and, um, they want to get out. Uh, we have a lot of applications for the the number of kids that we enroll. So it's a selective process. Uh, we don't take kids who don't want to be there. Um, mm-hmm. We're not motivated to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we work on overcoming those barriers. So what's the typical time frame that someone is in the program and then? Well, so it's a six months training program, but we uh, we say that often it's like if we try to average it out, it's usually like. 18 months from when we first see somebody to when they're ready to go. And there's at least two or three touch points, meaning they'll come, we'll place them in a job. They'll lose that job because they're not showing up every day or they do no call, no shows. So that they come back, take them again, we place them again. Um, and so it's, it, it, typically it's a couple of touch points. Um, and it's maybe a year from when we first encounter them. Uh, it, it, a lot of it depends upon age. You know, if we get somebody at 18, it's usually going to take some time for them to be ready to work a full time, you know, or do a job that does a living wage like construction. I mean, when I was 18, I wasn't ready to get up and work seven to three thirty five five mm. days a week. Yeah. Um, you know, I went to college and had all kinds of freedoms and was able to do all kinds of silly stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't have that luxury, but you know, somebody who's ready to work seven to three thirty at 18 is that's a different kind of person. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times it takes them till you know, we'll do some service jobs or do some warehousing jobs or something. And then when they're 22, 23, then they're starting to be ready to, okay, now I, I want a totally different lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And then when you get into construction, you can make a living wage, but you have to set yourself up. You can't be couch surfing and work construction. Um, you know, that it's just too exhausting. Um, it takes too much stability. So, 
that you know we work through all that with them with the goal of getting them a, a livable wage job mm -hmm. wow so does it go beyond just woodworking is it like the personal relationship and oh, human it's, element it's well? it's all personal relationships um it's woodworking is you know uh we laughed early on when we were back in the boat building world that you have this like fantasy of somebody in a shop with a hand plane like shaving you know with shavings on the ground and and that's not what it's about it's not you know i got into it because i was really excited about woodworking and i did want a hand plane in a shop and like make doing hand cut dovetails and that's what gets me excited but that's not what what this kids are excited about the kids are excited about personal relationships and about being successful mm -hmm. and seeing what that's about and so it's all personal relationships mm -hmm. um Again, you know, um, the, we, I do a lot of kind of talks with people about workforce development and pulling people out of poverty. And a lot of these organizations that we work with want to scale it. They want it to be scalable. They talk about scale. Like, mm -hmm. Can we well, let's make this big? Like, let's like really conquer. And I'm, you know, and I tell them over and over again that this isn't scalable. Like the problems that these kids, it's like trying to identify one single problem that's, that's causing the, the issues with poverty and, you know, the, the issues that we have in the city. And, uh, you know, they're like, uh, people want a, a, a quick answer. Is it, is it the welfare system or is it the, you know, the lack of the, the nuclear family or, you know, there's no fatherhood, like whatever. And I'm like, <laughs> Well, it starts with prenatal nutrition, and then it's early childhood development, and then it's the word gap, and then it's underfunded schools, and then there's homelessness, and then there's, you know, food deserts, and then there's the ju judicial system, and then there's systemic racism, and then there's the judicial system being, you know, uh, biased against people of poverty. Uh, there's, you know, it, it's all through. There's all these things that stack up, and there's no easy answer. Yeah. You know, there's no quick fix. There's not one thing that we can fix that's going to change it. Um, and what m makes these kids successful is personal relationships. It's like, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's kind of like raising children. Mm -hmm. Like you, you have to look, look at the whole person and deal with the whole person mm -hmm. to get these kids out of where they're at and into a, you know, a place to be successful. And that's not a scalable thing. You know, yeah. it, every, 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 trainee we have has has a different set of needs and has a, it, it's going to need different things to be successful it, you know and it's not we argue all the time about a handbook you know we're employee handbook and we're going to hold these kids responsible to this level of and it doesn't work that way because each kid is different and each kid you know you have to treat differently just like like raising children and um and that's the you know, the difficult part because it, it, people want there to be an answer in a, on a grand scale. And the answer is it, it takes a lot of individual attention and it takes a lot of personal relationships and it's, an, it's, you know, and it's intense. It's, you're not going to find a 12 week program to pull somebody out of the, that kind of a situation. Yeah. It's, it takes a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. So what are some things you're building, like looking forward to in the future? Uh, um, a bunch of good stuff. We're, I, I mean, our kind of big thing, I mean, we're building the new shop, which is awesome. Um, so we've been working on that for a couple of years and we are having a, uh, event on December 7th. So it has to be done on <laughs> December 7th. So we're excited about that. Um, our kind of big job coming up is, uh, we're, there's the city of Wilmington wants us to do a big outdoor bench for Rodney square which is going to be a big project, um, big stainless steel bench that can be taken apart and put back together. So that's exciting. Um, there's a couple of houses that we're doing on the east side that uh, we're re redoing. Um, so, yeah, it's it's good stuff. There's um, restaurants that we're you know, working on restaurants in Philly, doing some tables and, and bar backs for restaurants. So uh, a, a lot of our work now is commercial um, when we move to the new shop and we have to exp you know, expand our, our sales, we're probably going to do more residential. Um, mm -hmm. the, the margins are good on residential. 
uh, but the volume is good on commercial. So we'll see what the split is when we move. Hmm. So how has your companies or the challenge programs, um, vision and goals like evolved over time? Cause you probably were focused on a totally different thing in your twenties and then you were, you probably changed in your thirties and then your forties. And then now, like, what did that look like? Uh, well, that's I mean, an interesting question. The, I mean, we, at first I was into the woodworking and the building and the boats and the, and the timber frames. Um, and it became obvious that the product was less important than the case management. So I, somewhere around six or seven years in, I figured out the case management aspect. And so then that became more important, uh, to, do you know to be more outcome driven as far as successful placements and tracking and all that of the graduates um so I, then the focus switched into state sustainability so somewhere after we once the challenge program became pretty stable as it was we started to think about you know do we want a revenue stream and that's what we started the furniture business so that mm. that became the focus in the mid you know, 2010s, we started the business. And then that, that's where I spend most of my time now is on the business aspect. And now with the new shop, it's kind of, I'm starting to think of succession as like, is the challenge program going to last after I am gone or I mm. do something else. And that's about building a, uh, the, uh, the kind of business that can last when you, you, you know, founder like me moves on, you're going to have somebody have to, come in and take over am I building a a, a a company that can last at that and that mm. that's kind of a, the important thing for me for the next I don't know it's eight nine years that's what I'm going to be focused on succession planning succession planning yeah and just you know building the kind of structure and the leadership within the build within the uh, company um, within the organization that can so that I'm less and less important <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that it's less and less dependent on me. And then what, by the time I hand it over that we've got the infrastructure in place that, that I become, you know, I, cause it's important for me for this to last mm -hmm. and, and to have that kind of legacy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm of an age where I don't know if this is going to be my last job, but like, I, I got to think about what's what's next for the program. So, yeah. so how does uh, like a nonprofit and then a business like coincide? How does that work together? So, I mean, it's 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 tricky. So we were when we were doing uh, we first started to do these restaurants. Um, it became overwhelming to try and be a training program and work with commercial clients. Um, there's an expectation of professionalism and getting stuff done on time. And we weren't charging enough for what we were doing. Um, uh, the kids are paid by the contract, but it was still, you know, we were undervaluing our product and it, it was just a mess. I was trying to run a business and run a nonprofit at the same time and it's not, doesn't work. That's why we started the social enterprise CP furniture, which is a separate budget. It's not a separate entity. It's under the same 501c3, but it is... Uh, you know, it, it operates differently from the training program and we hire graduates. So we still have a social mission, but we're running like a business. So um, somebody like Scott, God bless him, would never hire the challenge program to do his tables because <laughs> he needs his tables on time. <laughs> he needs a, a certain standard. You know, it's, you've got to be able to do the work. Mm -hmm. um, and it, so that it, it was two different there were two different things and it's worked well. I mean, having this social enterprise has been great because it kind of ticks a different box than running the nonprofit. It's, you know, you, you can try and make money. Um, and, and, you know, and that's important. I'm, that's why I like these social enterprises. I'm part of a network of social enterprises across the, the country, um, that do workforce development. And I think it's important it's different from a nonprofit, you know, mindset because you do run your own business and you mm -hmm. can as, as an entrepreneur, both try and make some money and help people. Mm. Um, it's a double bottom line, but, uh, it, it tracks a different kind of person 
um, a different caliber of entrepreneur than say somebody who might want to work at uh, you know at a job corps or who might you know running your own mm -hmm. show and having some you know sweat in the game some you know having something uh, at stake attracts a different caliber of um, of person and you know the, the the workforce development world needs people like that. People who are driven, people who want to be their own boss, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then you see, you can see in Wilmington, there's people like Jason and um, Avilas, mm -hmm. who I know you guys know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, Markivas at Nerd It Now, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's starting to show some, you know, kind of driven, talented people who are, hey, you know, I can, I can both have my own shop and, you know, do some workforce development on the, and, and do both. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think that's exciting. Mm hmm so I, I, it's in, you know, I, when I look at the around with this, this, uh, social enterprise group that I'm part of the people that I admire most, um, and that I excited about their program most are people who like me, who've started something, whether it's a coffee shop or there's, you know, grilled cheese shop or a land, landscaping business, mm -hmm. and they do it as a social enterprise. You, you get some really talented people. What do you mean when you say social enterprise? So they, they call it employment social enterprise. Um, and it's, uh, it's basically a company with a double bottom line, which is one, oh, okay. you have to do workforce training and two, you have a business. Um, the, the, the foundation that I'm a part of is called Red F and they're out of San Francisco, but they sort of uh, kind of incubate these social enterprises. And so mm -hmm. th there's, there's a bunch in Philly, um, I mean, Food Bank has uh, the West End Neighborhood House has one. Food Bank has one in, in the culinary where they run a cafe. Um, but in Philly, there's like a, a coffee shop that's one. Um, there's a brewery called Triple Bottom. There's a glass recycling place called Remark, which makes um, kind of custom glassware out of recycled mm -hmm. glass. Uh, you know, and, and they're, they're around the country. There's a guy in D.C. that does construction and cleaning. Um, and so he does house renovations and he has a cleaning service and I think he does events too. It's like he does a cleanup for events mm -hmm. and it's all, uh, returning individuals, people out of coming out of the judicial system that he hires. Mm -hmm. So, um, and these companies are, they do a pretty good job. And, um, and, and it's, again, so it's a small individualized thing. It's, it's small businesses with, you know, kind of, uh, intense, interaction with their clients and, um, and there's a job it's, there's paid, you know, it's a paid experience for the, mm -hmm. the people. So it's a good formula. Yeah. So who, um, hires ch the challenge program? Like what type of people or contractors or clients? It's all kinds. Uh, I mean, we've been, you know, fortunate The Delaware is very supportive. Uh, so we've worked for just about everybody. We've got, you know, we've got jobs with Buccini, DeSabatino, Petnero, um, EDIS, uh, you know, a uh, bunch of different restaurants. We did all the Wilmington Brew Works, Pizzeria Metro, all those, uh, in North Wilmington did all those places. A lot of different uh, Market Street restaurants we work for. CSC is one of our best clients. Um, obviously done these tables. And, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> done work for CSC. Um, so the city of Wilmington is hiring us. So, you know, and, and then we do a lot of work in Philly. Okay. Um, so there's some residential, again, not as much residential, more commercial. Um, but, you know, we're trying to get in with, uh, so higher ed. We've done work for Penn and University of Delaware, Swarthmore. Um, the more of that we can get, the better. Mm -hmm. um, we don't market. It's all word of mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna, that's going to have to change. Yeah. when we move into the new building because we're expanding. Mm -hmm. um, so we're working on branding, trying to figure out how we're going to market and how we're going to market in a way that's sustainable. Okay. Um, so, you know, we don't want to just put it out there and suddenly we got too much demand and not no capacity to fulfill that demand. Yeah. So we've got to be careful about how we, uh, how we expand, but we're looking to expand. Mm -hmm. Is there any benefit for people to hire a um, five? What's it called? Five o five o one c three. Yeah. Uh, not there's a, it's not a tax write off. We're you know we're like another business. I mean the what we offer is 
uh, a high level of customization and, and a high level of uh, uh, attention. So we, I think that's a big part of why people hire, hire us. Um, and we're high quality. And, and then there's a story behind it. Then you can you know, feel people mm-hmm. feel good about what they've done. Mm-hmm. Um, we did a branding exercise and, and uh, came to realize that really the people, reason why people hire us is because we're local and uh, we do have do do high quality, um, and then the social mission is kind of secondary. It's more about being like, uh, you know, a lot of these places will order uh, some tables from overseas, and the tables will come, and they won't be the right color, and they'll be uh, they won't um, the the bases will fall apart, and then you can't return them, and you can't get your money back. And you're not going to ship them back to where you got them from. Yeah. And so then they call us to fix it. And so that is a lesson that's been learned and where people are like, okay, you might spend a little more from the, from out of the gate, Mm -hmm. but in the end it's going to pay because if you have an issue, we'll come fix it. Um, which they always have an issue. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're, you know, Chris Scott just said, we're, we're coming up and fixing some stuff for him. Um, and if he had ordered the tables online, yeah, there wouldn't be any, you know, he would, he, there would be no buddy to call. So, um, that is an important part of what we do. Yeah. What did that process or progress look like in getting your name out there? Uh, not j- because I know that, you know, you were connected to me directly from Scott and it seems like you're, you know, you're the director of the entire program. You're kind of the brand or you're the face of the entire thing, but it's like, 30 years, that's a long time. And it's like, it didn't happen all right in the beginning, all right at once. It was probably like a snowball effect, right? Uh, it's, it's building relationships. It's, uh, I mean, I think there's, um, one, you know, I, I like to think that I've been doing what I've been doing and doing a good job at it, which it's you know advertisement in itself but there's also some credibility you get in doing what we've been doing for so long um so you know i'm not in it for the short term i'm not in it for you know to feel good about it you know feel Mm -hmm. good about myself you know it's it's like i've been committed to this for 30 years it's i've you know shown that this is what i'm what i do Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that gives me a, a amount of credibility. That's sort of a, a, a you know, a award for <laughs> sticking with something for a really long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it's like an old age award, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it does, it, it, it that may, has made a lot of difference. And I think that, you know, part of the secret sauce of the challenge program is that I've had very little turnover. I've had you know, two employees who have been with me for all close to 20 years. And that kind of stability resonates with the, 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 uh, trainees and they, they, you know, you get some credibility yeah. and having been around, like people don't th- think you're just in it for the short term. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that, it, I mean, that's a big part of it. I think it's just, it's just kind of longevity. Yeah. Um, uh, the, and that has everybody kind of, realizes that you know i'm in it for the long term and i'm in it for the right reasons and then you know then we pride ourselves on doing a good job and so that Mm -hmm. kind of like spread that spreads the word and i you know i honestly i don't market myself that much and market the challenge program that much and i think that people also kind of appreciate that Mm. um and that it's i'm not in it to kind of uh like market myself it's not yeah. about me, yeah. you know, it's about the program. It's about the trainees. It's about the product, mm-hmm. especially. So, um, yeah. Yeah. That's really incredible. I think, um, out of all the guests that we've had on our show, I don't think anybody has done what they were doing for more than 20 years. Do you know of any, yeah, that's <laughs> like the thing. It's just like to, yeah. do, to do one thing for more than 20 years to build a reputation, like, how do you keep yourself motivated or inspired to keep going for the marathon versus like the sprint? Um, I, you know, I, it's being your own boss. Like if I don't know how I would ever work for somebody at this point, <laughs> so it's like, what would I do? Yeah. Like I, I've, 
been my own boss since I was 25 and I don't really know what it would be like, you know, and my wife laughs, uh, like I have the ultimate cocktail party job. Mm -hmm. Like it, she comes in and she's an environmental lawyer and people are like, yawn. And then they're like, what do you do? And I tell them and they're all like, wow, that's really cool. <laughs> so I get the cool cocktail party job and I like to build, I like to build stuff. Um, and so I get to go back today and you know all the headache of HR and fundraising and trying to come up with money to build the building I get to spend three hours in the shop you know building a custom door mm. and that makes me happy and so um, you know I could put my headphones on and listen to music and build stuff and you know, and nobody can tell me that's not what I should be doing. Yeah. Even though it's probably not what I should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. Cause that's, that's what keeps me happy and that's what keeps me going. And so I'm going to spend three hours every day working in the shop. Um, and I probably shouldn't, you know, <laughs> and the person who follows me probably won't, but Hey, you know, it's what I like. Yeah. So, um, and that, and really that's what's kept me going for 30 years is cause I like it. It's like, it, you, you know, it's that the whole trope where you, if you like what you do, if you, your hobby is your job, you never go to work or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I've kind of had that, yeah, the, the yeah. fortune, good fortune of having that. Yeah. I feel like I have a similar connection to you where it's like, yeah, I am kind of my own boss, even though like, Hey, I'm part of this team. I'm part of this ecosystem. I got to come, I got to contribute towards the ecosystem, but I do have a level of autonomy that, I do enjoy getting coffees. I do enjoy getting lunches with people, new to, meeting new people all the time and figuring out how can I support them and what they're doing and like, how can we create synergy? Yeah, no, it's great. And I, yeah, I appreciate you've like jumped in when we met like what a week ago and you're all excited getting all this stuff done. And I like that. So it's, uh, and, and Scott says, you know, you were somebody who makes things happen and that's what he likes about us, about me working with us. And, it, and you know, it, it, it does give you energy to find people who are like-minded that, that way. And, and um, I've been fortunate uh, with the program to have, you know, we, the architects who did our um, first building was their first, it was their first job working for themselves. And, you know, their company's kind of grown as the challenge program's grown. And now they have 55 architects and they're all over, wow. working all over the country and, doing jobs for Princeton and doing jobs in Arkansas for Walmart. And they're a huge successful firm, but they're just a bunch of guys, you know, that they were in my age. And there's another guy that uh, designs fonts that was out in York Lynn. And he's got, there were two guys that started a font design business called House Industries. And, you know, they came along the same time I came along. And, you know, I don't think they would ever do anything else. <laughs> you know, it's just, we, we have that kind of synergy. There's a, um, the woman that runs Tallulah's garden, that's the restaurant in Philly, uh, again, started Tallulah's garden, a similar time frame as me. We're like people who started businesses together and it's like, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it's fun to work with people like that that have that sort of kind of similar experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I definitely find myself drawn to that. Um, and you know, in, in, bonding over those things so with all the things coming up is there anything that maybe like the viewers could help provide you that would be helpful to the challenge program oh uh, i mean you know again we're going public soon i now i'm doing a podcast we're uh building a new shop and um and yeah it's going to be open to the public there's going to be a showroom um wow and, yeah <laughs> so uh we are actually going to put ourselves out there and so Coming soon, I'm actually going to have to do social media, which I have no oh. idea. <laughs> um, and we're going to start trying to get some, you know, uh, press conference kind of things. I don't know, a press conference, but like announcements, press releases. Oh, they have okay. to do press mm -hmm. releases and get some attention to the program, which is not my uh, natural inclination. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, we'll start to hear more about it and, and about the CP furniture and, and what the products that we do. And um, you can go on the website. And it's, uh, we're launching a new website. I'm not sure if it's live yet, but it's any day now. Okay. Um, it's called cpfurniture.org. Um, and the challenge program is going to get a new website and yeah, we're going to start, uh, like marketing ourselves to the public, okay. um, the, for the first time. So, mm -hmm. um, we've got to manage expectations. We're still only like seven, eight people in the shop, um, in the furniture shop. Um, we'll, we'll grow. Um, and we'll be able to take on a lot more eventually, but, uh, it's going to be a process. Mm. 
how did you guys market before the challenge program to get all the different apprentices? Um, the apprentices is all word of mouth. It was all word of mouth. They yeah. just came out of nowhere. It's like, oh, I used to be part of this. And then, yeah, it's, well, I mean, we pay for, we've always paid for um, the whole program so you get when you're doing ged when you're doing job search like the whole time you're there you're getting paid oh wow and so it's a it's a paid training experience and you're paid for all the other stuff the job training the the ged the classes the tutoring whether you're going to the dmv to get your id you're getting paid um and so that's a big attraction and then you know it's word of mouth so people kids will tell other their friends about it um and they you know are uh they have they're, they're proud of it and they like i, I got a kiddo i think's ready you know i got a friend who's ready and so they recommend people who we think they think will be successful and we think can be successful so that's been our best recruitment tool um every once in a while we go out and and have to kind of broadcast out because we want to get out of friend groups <laughs> we want to get like a mm-hmm. diversity of of uh people that, that are that are coming in so we'll do that uh but most of the time it's word of mouth it's awesome you got anything else josh oh. well thanks a lot andrew i really appreciate you being on our show and i know it's a, such an honor for us to be kind of part of your the beginning of your social media journey <laughs> it's like this is really uncanny <laughs> like oh well, this is fun and uh, yeah this is a heck of a production so i i appreciate it and appreciate your time um yeah, it's fun. Thanks for having me. You've been a heck of a guest. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, right. it's great. This All has right. been the Nigerian Podcast signing out. Peace.